Today, me and Lily are at the Fisher Museum, which is part of Harvard, actually Harvard Forest. So this is a pretty small museum with quite a few dioramas. So I'm actually just gonna go through and talk a little bit about each one. I'm going to go in order because um, that makes sense. So this is diorama number one of 23. So the first collection of dioramas show the same location throughout history. So this would be 1700-ish. So at this point, it is a mixture of old growth, which you can see over here. You have some new growth mixed in. Things like disease, windstorms, ice, fires, um, clearing by the aboriginals, Native Americans, uh, and burnings basically shapes the forest. So here is kind of your older growth on the right. On the left, we have some species that are shade intolerant. So now 1740-ish, um, you have quite a bit of clear cutting going on and subsistence farming. So even at this point, central Massachusetts, Peter Sam, this area was actually relatively remote. And so people relied pretty much on their farm for everything. Trade was pretty minimal because the roads weren't very good. 1830-ish was the height of farm development in New England. Uh, around this time, between 60 to 80 percent of the land was cleared. Peter Sam, where this museum is, 75 percent of the land was clear. So trees were basically left, fence rows, swamps, places where it was too rough for farming. Improved roads for trade was a big part of what sparked more farming in central Massachusetts. But that improved infrastructure eventually actually led to its downfall. So New England farms peaked, however, this was the beginning of railroads and canals being created out west. And what ended up happening was is that out west, you know, they can just grow so much food that these New England farms couldn't really compete, and so a lot of them were abandoned. Now what happened is after they were abandoned, white pines um, in the fence rows and wood lots, they ended up taking over these old fields because they grow quickly, and they end up taking over. So you can kind of see here, there's the abandoned farm. See this one, it's a working farm. In this one, it's an abandoned farm. You can see the pine starting to take over. Somebody's having a great day hunting with his dog. Not too dissimilar from the cedars and the tree plantations and tree farms where I live in Japan, this created a situation where you had large numbers of the same species of tree all about the same age. So this diorama is for 1910. Around this time, they started logging all of these white pines. And so there were these mobile sawmills that they would move to a location, cut down the trees, you know, chop them up and log them, and then they would move on to the next location. So it was very easy for them to go from farm to farm or former farm to former farm and cut down these white pines. Now the white pines themselves, they were used for boxes, barrels, machines, toys. And at this point, corrugated cardboard didn't exist, so most shipping was done with a, a pine box, a white pine box. After the white pines were cut, hardwood seeds that were underneath the pine floor ended up taking over. So now we have the beginning of hardwoods. So I'm a little curious what a lot of Japan would look like if we just cut down all those cedar trees. Um, the reason for that in Japan actually is because lumber prices collapsed and so it wasn't economically worthwhile to cut down all of these cedar that they had planted. So now we can start to see small hardwood. So it's starting to produce cover and food for animals like deer, kind of thick stuff I've hiked through. Now, now sort of unfortunately, the historical models only go up to 1930. So this is 20 years after cutting of the white pine. So now the hardwoods are tall enough that they are getting eaten less by deer, particularly their tops. And so this has given them an opportunity to grow quite large. Let's look at a little bit of a process of how you go from a 
white pine lot to hardwood. So one of the things that they did before they cut the white pines is they went in underneath and they found the shoots of hardwoods and they would actually cut them. And so that way they would re-sprout after the logging. Now then, it has to be kind of treated a little bit like a garden. So they then weed the forest in favor of the best stems, um, taking out poor trees, trees that are sick, so that you have the best trees and the most valuable trees growing. And then you have to do it again after 10 years. Now, let's say you have a drier site. So if it's a drier site, they actually treated it a little differently. So because it's dry, the uh, hardwoods are less vigorous and the pine can take over. So it's actually replanted and then weeded so that you have both, you have pine and hardwood. So it's a very similar process, but the pines help out and so you have a mixed lot. Once the trees get bigger, it's time to go in and do improvement cutting. So you go in, you decide which trees, either for species or health reasons that you don't want in there, you mark them, you cut them, they become firewood traditionally. Now, this is also the point where they find wolf trees. So wolf trees are ones that are left over from previous cuttings. So they're generally taller and wider at the tops. So oftentimes they are girdled and killed so that they don't compete and kill off the younger new trees. So after improvement cutting, you're left with pretty much just the species that you want. So the first thinning, you go in and you cut down trees that for health reasons or position you don't want. You try to select the best ones to keep. And at this point, once again, after they're cut and marked out, they can be sold as fuel wood. So wood for burning to heat your house. So you can see um, this gentleman over here is marking trees to be cut. Uh, they're cutting the trees. This section has already been cut, so it's a little thinner, less trees competing, so the trees that remain can uh, grow healthy and valuable. Here's the same stand at 60 years old, so this is the third thinning. Now at this point, we've only left the very best trees. So managed woodlots like this, they produce much uh, higher quality timber. So at this point, we're just leaving the very, very best trees to produce lumber. From the third thinning, um, we're getting small saw logs, fuel wood to help pay for the whole operation. This diorama is the only one that shows a real place and it's Harvard Pond. Now, originally I had planned to hike out to Harvard Pond with Lillian after this museum, but um, It's a little white and cold out there. Part of what makes Harvard Pond so interesting is the old growth forest. The area is not suitable for agriculture and it's also sheltered so storms don't come in and basically kill all the trees. So it is one of those rare old growth forests in New England. These are um, between one and 200 year old trees. Um, here. Here in the diorama, we can see Professor Fisher standing and Professor Schaller. So Professor Fisher was a forestry professor. This museum is named after him. And Professor Schaller was the Dean of Sciences at Harvard and was a strong advocate for the establishment of Harvard Forest. However, um, because of some of his other views, he's kind of persona non gratis at Harvard now. One issue with drier, stony sites like this was that hardwood wouldn't grow straight, it would grow kind of scraggly like that. And so it was really only good for cordwood, so being burnt. So a lot of times they would be cut for cordwood, the um, scraps would be burnt, and then pine trees would be planted by hand. Now you can also see here on the left, it's being trimmed now. So they have to do weeding on it too. So you can grow better pine here than you can hardwood. Now, this is quite labor intensive as you notice, so it's not really done anymore with uh, one exception. 
Christmas tree farms. One thing that used to be different is now hardwood is the valuable wood. However, at times, pine was the valuable wood. So here we have an abandoned farm. Now, oftentimes, when you look on the right, you have white birch growing in with the pines. Now the birch grows quickly and grows tall, and so at first it actually works as a way to protect the pine trees, both from pests and wind. However, eventually, if the pines are going to get bigger, you have to remove the birch. So that's what they would do. They would remove the birch. So now you just have the white pine. They want the white pine to grow nice and big and be used for logs from timber. For white pine timber, just like hardwood, you want a nice straight log. And so pruning was actually very important because pruning by cutting down the off these lower branches like this guy is here near the base, it meant that the wood would not get knotted so you'd have a nice straight grain. So you can see here's an older stand being pruned and here's a mature stand. So final pruning at uh, 20, 25 years and it clears the lowest uh, 17 feet so that the part that's cut for a log, standard log length 17 feet, is nice and clear. Also, it looks nicer and it makes it more visible under there and easier to navigate and move. Here we see group selection cutting of white pines. This isn't really done around here anymore, but what they would do is they would come in and they would cut one section and leave it to be reseeded by an older section that then would be cut later. Now, a lot of the methods that we've talked about here are quite labor intensive, particularly the replanting part. So let's look at this. We have uniform shelter wood cut cutting. So this is for natural reproduction. So what you do is you go in and you cut and then you leave a few trees of each species that you want and that they then reseed the ground. Now, another one is called strip shelter wood cutting. Um, this is not very common in central New England. So basically, you have a stand and you cut it one strip at a time. So you gradually remove this old strand going from left to right. So it results in these strips of natural pines. So this diorama shows an abandoned farm. And so you notice it's starting to be reclaimed. And so you actually have different types of habitat here. You have the old growth, you have new growth, you have pine, you have some medium age growth too. And so a diversity of different types of forest and different types of land is good for animals. Now, one of the problems we face is that if everything returns to, you know, full forest, that's maybe not really good for a lot of animal species who rely on fresh cuts, rabbits, for example, fox, deer, you know, areas that are dynamic and different environments nearby each other produce more animals and good for wildlife. That's also why active management is very important for conservation. You know, we can't just take our forests and ignore them. We need to actively manage them. And of course, we have the challenges of erosion. So here we can see erosion off the fields, erosion off the pastures, gullying of the brooks. So when the land was more open, there was more problems with erosion here in New England. And you actually still see it quite a bit in more developed areas where there isn't the trees and such to hold it in place. So for example, if we look at this side, there's forest here and that helps slow down and mitigate erosion. Not forest here, well, yeah, look at your fence. And in this diorama, we have a forest fire and 1930s forest fire fighting methods. Now, at the time, in the 1930s, the policy was basically to suppress all forest fires, which and now the fire's out. Now, one of the issues in the 1930s was that conifers, like white pine, burn much easier and are a higher risk of forest fire than hardwood, and much of New England was pine, this white pine that we were talking about earlier. 
Now, at the time, the belief was is that these were extremely destructive, that forest fires destroyed the local ecology and that we needed to put large amounts of effort into stopping them, uh, a wisdom that we kind of are walking away from and our viewpoint has changed. Our final diorama is a diorama on how the dioramas are made. They were made by a group of artists. Oh, here it is. Samuel J. Guernsey and Theodore B. Pittman in Cambridge, Mass. As you can see, they started with shaping the land, wire frames, the trees are made out of copper, with then paint and enamel. It's pretty impressive. Well, what do you think, Lil Lil? All right, I hope that you enjoyed this little tour of Harvard Forest Fisher Museum. So please like, share, subscribe, go down to the comments, tell me what you think about this museum or other kind of cool, fun little museums, maybe where you grow up or live that most people wouldn't know about. And I will see you in my next adventure.